Hey, happy Friday, everybody. It's good to be with you today, Hollywood Breaks. Um, we've had uh, a fun morning already, a lot of laughter and joy as we kind of went through uh, our setup for today. So excuse us if we're already huge smiles waiting for, uh, waiting for this recording to start. Uh, but I can't do it without my partner and friend, Keith. Keith, welcome to Hollywood Breaks this morning, Friday. Tim, I'm glad we were finally able to get the, uh, the show on the road here after about an hour of uh, technical difficulties. Hard to believe we're in the 21st century. I felt like we were back in the 19th for a while there. Maybe I should uh, move my studio to remote Maine. I'd have better access. <laughs> yeah, <than> exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll point it out. Five shows from rural Maine. Not a single blip. You're down in Orange County, California, and you can't even get the computer to run. Today is oh, literally man. Hollywood breaking. I can't get <laughs> Hollywood to work in Hollywood. California well. is breaking, obviously. That's not just Hollywood. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, you know, there's so much going on on Fridays. Um, I love this, like, post-media dump that we kind of get into our lab um, and get to process things. But we can't go too far without our weekly movie poster review. And right above your shoulder is a classic. Um, did you do this film? Is this your campaign? I did not. Um, uh, I, was, I was trying to uh, brack my brain to think why I had this poster. And I think the reason is, um, I think the design of it's cool. First of all, it's Terminator Salvation, for those of you who cannot see, um, and which is a movie that's probably more famous for uh, an actor's diatribe on set than the actual movie itself. Um, but uh, I think I got the poster because I really loved the trailer. The design of the original, the first trailer was just phenomenal. And there was some really great imagery in it, um, sort of tapping on the history of uh, James Cameron's dystopian world that he had created in the Terminator universe. Yeah, right. Uh, and obviously, I think, um, you know, having a Christian Bale in a Terminator movie is, is, is a pretty great thing. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. But um, this design in particular is brought to us by the group at Midnight Oil. Um, but I think this was a Warner Brothers movie? Yeah, it was Warner Brothers. Um, so obviously, when I was at Fox, I had access to a lot of movie posters. And this was just one that I happened to snag. One I thought was cool. And I also thought the trailer was great. So I love Midnight Oil. I remember there was somebody that Brandon was uh, at, a, at a conference in an elevator. Big guy, big personality or whatever. And uh, to sit down and kind of explore the world that he does, the creative uh, world that Midnight Oil does, super great. Uh, yeah, it's very group, cool. Group very guys, cool. Um, beautiful work. And a lot of the posters, or a lot of the billboards I see along Hollywood Boulevard, some of the best that I see out there are these uh, multidimensional kind of uh, architecture things are mm -hmm. created by them so yep. great group you know it's kind of fun that you um like you there's a part of pop culture that a lot of people um don't reference directly into who makes that piece but a lot like movie posters the trailers the the um promo pieces are all part of the overall movie experience and, and marketing experience yep um, but so many of us just reference the film itself and forget all that build up behind it but um, as you and I know, like these collectibles that you're, if you have over your shoulder are the ones that retain some value over many, many years. So pretty mm -hmm. fun. Yep. All right, let's jump into it because big things are happening, especially over at our friends at Disney. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess from the, from early on, we've kind of been seeing the moving and shaking and some of what's fun is to cover it on a week by week basis. Um, but uh, Disney's marketing really did make a, a big move uh, last night. Um, and the media dump and the and the feed that we're getting just like the restructuring really is solidifying on how the marketing um, departments really are starting to convert into um, one uh, one division and and uh, Mandalorian teams are are actually being pushed more and more and more. And you're saying some of your friends on LinkedIn are even changing their titles to add like a Disney Plus. And yeah. to some of their other stuff. Yeah, so just give a little backstory uh, to some of your, um, some of our viewers and listeners who may not be familiar with sort of the process here. So typically what happens on a theatrical release is on Deadline Hollywood, which is a, a website that's part of the whole Deadline Variety Hollywood Reporter trifecta of trade press in the, the business, um, usually runs a, a piece on a Friday about the marketing campaign of a movie and what was involved, what they did on social, when the trailer came out, like it gives like a soup to nuts from point A all the way to release um, of what happened with the marketing campaign. And about a week ago when WandaVision came out, um, there one popped up on deadline and I hadn't seen one in months because obviously there hasn't been a major movie campaign really since Tenet, 
And even then that was sort of stop and go, stop and go. So there really wasn't a traditional movie campaign. And what it turns out is they laid it out much like they do a theatrical campaign. And I was sort of reading through it and I noticed that um, Disney Theatrical Division, which is headed up by Saad Ayez, um, has taken what ran the campaign on one division, which is a TV series, well, t series, I'm not gonna say TV, series on Disney Plus. And his group ran that campaign as well as it seems like the Mandalorian season two campaign. So it's very interesting that because a bulk of what's gonna be on Disney Plus is driven by those brands of Marvel, Lucasfilm, <clears throat> Nat Geo, Pixar, what have you. So it seems like that is sort of the shift. And, you know, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that. But yeah, I've noticed a couple of former colleagues of mine and current Disney folk who have changed their titles to include Disney Plus. And so that's clear that it seems what we have been predicting with Kareem Daniels division sort of starting to have more of a foothold in a lot of what's happening over at Disney. That seems to be the case that it's starting to percolate in Disney Plus their marketing team may not necessarily be driving a lot of what's happening with some of these bigger properties like WandaVision and, um, and Mandalorian. So here's what I think of the, the big stuff that comes up from moves like this and why we've been kind of covering it, um, the strategy is playing out is one, we could claim it's just a reaction to the pandemic and, and the necessity of using Disney Plus instead of theatrical. And maybe it's even a reaction to trying to keep the theatrical marketing folks around, keep them, you know, keep them busy, give them some of the Disney Plus work, uh, that kind of work. But when you when you take the the traditional theatrical marketing group and you put them towards Disney Plus, um, you can imagine, uh, you know, a year from now, two years from now, they're just busy. They're busy doing Disney Plus items, and it changes what's possible in that group and capabilities of doing a future theatrical work. Mm -hmm. In a way, you can feel like Disney's a little bit giving up on the theatrical side, or at least they're saying it's not as relevant or as necessary as it used to be as part of their, their rollout plans for distribution. Yeah. That's all why it's really big is we're watching one of the biggest players and could have a player that could have the, one of the largest influences to getting theaters open, honestly, keeping pe pe people busy on something that's probably generating more revenue than the releases would have been in the theater anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's also, I think another contributing factor to this is also that Assad, who, as I said, is the head of theatrical marketing, has very good relationships with Kevin Feige at Marvel, uh, with Kathleen Kennedy at, at Lucasfilm. So I think that's a lot of what's driving all this. And they have great, they have great team over there, great strategy people, great creative, great digital marketing, very savvy. Um, so I think that's a lot of what's driving this. And you can kind of see that maybe they're also looking like, okay, maybe the Disney Plus team on the marketing side will handle more of the traditional digital side, be it email marketing, blasts, customer retention, things that are typically not necessarily sourced within theatrical marketing. And then the theatrical marketing is gonna take a little bit more of a lead on the strategy of it, as well as some of the creative materials, just because they, it, 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 it's going to be interesting to see if they do like a weekly rollout, like whether or not. So what I mean by that, so is like traditionally in TV, you do promos, you do weekly promos promoting what's coming next and this week on blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And Mandalorian was very much a weekly series where a new episode was released a week and you have to cut the recaps and all that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering if maybe that's coming from Disney plus. So maybe that stuff will still stay there. And then the real, the launching materials, because theatrical vision, the division has so much experience with regards to that, they'll take the lead on that. Sure. Um, it's just going to be interesting what the crossover is going to start to look like. I mean, because right now, you're right, they don't have a lot of things to do theatrically. So the team's sitting there, they're very talented. So why wouldn't you give them something to do? Um, the interesting thing is going to happen once the theatrical experience starts to come back are sort of the Kevin Faggies and the Kathleen Kennedys of the world going to be like, no, 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 I still want theatrical to do it because they cut the best stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. Disney Plus is going to be like, wait, what's going on? And, you know, then there's the whole Kareem Daniel aspect of it. It's like where things are going to exist, whether or not they're going to be on Disney Plus, whether or not they're going to be theatrical. I think about just from a consumer point of view too, like we're going to be so conditioned to getting theatrical release feeling right mm -hmm. there in our living room. Yep. How, do you, how do you boost something up to say now get off your couch 
drive down to a theater, sit in there with community people and, and watch it, you're already getting a large part of the experience. And, you know, Netflix put, uh, does this for uh, this strategy where they do their online platform first. And then when they want to win an Oscar, they put some shows into the <laughs> yeah, theater. Exactly. And as a consumer, it's kind of cool. Like you can, you can you watch a show on Netflix and say, oh, I'd love to see that in the theater. And then you get up and go do it because it yeah. seems like a relevant experience. But the, th the thought of theatrical second is such an interesting kind of shift. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic really is kind of conditioning us to a totally different game. So yeah, what I, we know I, is if we're going to track this thing over the next couple of years, that two year change is going to uh, create such a different foundation for the consumer part of it, the marketing part of it, the distribution part of it. And it's definitely going to take uh, have an effect on even the content creation part of it. You're going to tell different stories if you're a platform first. You're going to use different formats, different lengths of time, or even as we're seeing with some of the successful stuff on Netflix and, and uh, Disney Plus, it's series. Like you do episodic theatrical releases in shorter form, opposed to Lord of the Rings, which takes every two years to do, you know, a, a trilogy play out. You can do uh, releases in shorter areas. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting you bring up the whole theatrical experience and, you know, seen that some some surveys have been released in the last week or so in terms of whether or not people are going to be comfortable going back to the theaters one survey which was done by nrg i saw it was somewhere between 70 75 percent people were ready to go back to the theaters once it's safe it's a great number for the industry um Ener energy is sort of an inside player when it comes to hollywood so i'm not saying the numbers were skewed in any particular way um, but it's sort of important to keep that in mind and also that that was sort of the highest number they've seen over the course of the last month or almost year now hard to believe it's been almost a year yeah. um but then i saw another survey that was a, about a thousand people surveyed and 80 percent said no nah, i don't want to go back i'm perfectly happy now this could be what we could call the post wonder woman effect now that warner brothers has sort of created that sense of like well we're just going to put everything on hbo max has that reset the consumer expectation where no i could just watch it at home and with windows shrinking are people really going to want to get off their butts to go back to a theater to see a movie? And it's, I mean, it, it, it's really unpredictable at this point. You have an analyst in Wall Street who's saying by 2023, we're going to be, uh, the industry is going to have a record year. That's definitely possible. I mean, there's no denying that's possible. But at the same time, the flip, the flip side of it is, are people, have, have people adjusted enough mm -hmm. to the idea of just watching it at home and sort of understanding that the theatrical experience wasn't that great to begin with. Are they going to be ready to go right back into the theater again? Um, you know, uh, after being used to getting everything on, on the couch and, you know, having everything at their fingertips. Yeah. And, and uh, something even like with Wonder Woman, it's a total backfire, right? Where you, you know, they had this the premiere movie that if it was theatrical release first, you would go, you would go to the film, uh, you go to the theater, watch the film, and you make some investment into it, and they get that first run kind of box office boost from the film to begin with. And then later we watch it on a rerun or something like that on a platform. That's how we traditionally do it. Mm. In the case of Wonder Woman 1984, because it rolled out at the same time HBO Max was giving basically free previews, a lot of people took, took advantage of the, the preview, watched Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman didn't meet their expectations in a living room setting. It didn't really kind of play out the, any, to any uh, degree that it got any boost from the from anybody because that setting. And so Wonder Woman now, now that it's off the platform, has no nowhere to go. If it, if it goes to SVOD, people, most people have already seen it if you want to. It didn't give enough credentials to really make you want to pay a second time. It's definitely never going to go into a theatrical release. Yeah, um, and I'm not really sure HBO Max gained as many subscribers as they wanted to. It, if that was your first experience, and you didn't get that boost you wanted to, I don't, I don't feel the retention out there to keep my HBO Max subscription going. Yeah, I mean, right now they uh, they came out this week during the earnings call for Warner Media and said they made about they're up to about 17.2 million per up to Q4, which doubled from where they were in the last quarter. So, so that's a quarter, of, of, a quarter of the subscribers at Disney Plus has. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, looking at the number, like you got Netflix up here at 200 million. You've got Disney Plus at like 80 plus, and then you've got Peacock, which is around I think 30 or 40 or something like that. And then you've got HBO Max down here at 17, 17 and change. 
Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is how much they damaged the Wonder Woman brand. Mm -hmm. um, and just the, the DC brand in general. DC brand in general has been struggling regardless of what your feelings are on Wonder Woman. But Wonder Woman was seen as like the crown jewel of that. That's like, this is where we can potentially go because it was, the first one was so well received. It got away from the sort of Zack Snyder-y brooding dark. Um, it was sort of like the first really, you know, great female superhero, you know, Captain Marvel aside, but this was sort of like the, the one that had been around for generations. And, uh, and they've just done such, I don't know if it's irreparable, probably not. Um, but at the same time, they've done a lot of damage just with how tedious the movie was, the performances were bad, the script was a, was a nightmare. And I think that's something they have to take, take in consideration. And even though, yeah, they've, they've seen an uptick in, in uh, subscriptions, which is great, but to your point, it's very easy to cancel. Like you cancel. I mean, now the, the flip, the, they're also pushing, because I'm a subscriber at HBO Max, so I get a lot of the email, email ads, and they're, they now have a sizzle reel uh, when you open the HBO Max and when you get in an email that's just basically pushing hard on the, all, our, all our releases, same day they go into the theater, are going to be on HBO Max. It's, it but, felt like to me a CinemaCon sizzle reel <laughs> being pushed toward, instead of exhibitors, pushed towards consumers, which yeah. is, is it's hard to believe that they're just so like 100% into this that they almost forgot, oh yeah, theaters, we're still here. Um, I can't imagine the, the shakeup of the, of the filmmakers too. Yeah. I mean, if, that, if this is the strategy and they're not gaining, they took Wonder Woman and they, um, you know, again, you know, maybe it's just bad luck or maybe they're thinking they're just going to uh, bury Wonder Woman and, and find something, uh, James Bond or something like that to c carry them out of it at some other uh, point in the future. Um, but really, like, if you're a filmmaker and you're signed up with Warner Brothers or trying to make a film with Warner Brothers and you see this play out and the greatest audience you're going to get is 17 million subscribers, that's not going to, that's not enough visibility for a filmmaker to want to go that way. I, I agree with you a lot in what you said. Um, you know, it's a lot of the talent relationships. It's hard to see. I would love, love to see some of these sort of P&Ls on, which is a profit and loss statement for those of you who aren't familiar with the technology, the term of it. Um, particularly in the industry, um, before a movie gets greenlit, there's a P&L that's run just sort of across the course of all streams of revenue um, based on how much money the movie is projected to make throughout the course of its lifetime. Um, I would love to see those statements right now because back when I was sort of in that side of the business, um, it was fascinating to see how much they were estimating from home entertainment, how much distribution was going to get, um, international, like all these ancillary streams of revenue, that's all been upturned. And now, especially with um, what HBO Max has done and Warren Brothers in particular, just sort of announcing that, oh, we're doing this without really doing any sort of constructive outreach with talent. Um, I mean, they're gonna, they have to give more money. They got to you know, pay more to all the top talent, little things which came out today, which is the Denzel Washington, John Lee Hancock film. Um, I'm sure if Denzel was like, you got to pay it. You got to pay up. I made this movie on the assumption it was going to be in theaters. You owe me money now. Yeah. Where's my back end? So that's again. So they're, oh, they're above the line type costs are going to shoot through the roof. Um, and it's hard to see how they're really going to make a substantial amount of money uh, on this. And, you know, there, I've seen some tweets about Wonder Woman saying like, if you had held this off until next spring, you could still have made more money. Instead, you put it out there, you make middling, you make a horrible um, uh, via box office in domestic, not so great internationally either. Who knows what the numbers look like on, on HBO Max. And you basically destroyed the franchise in a lot of tents and purposes. You've yeah, damaged and, You know, regardless if it was HBO Max or a theater, the, the franchise, the conversation of they ruined the franchise or not, or the, or the creative aspects of it, you're dealing with that no matter what. You have cri critics That's no matter what dealing with that kind of attributes. But in the case of just the distribution strategy, and honestly, just what the dynamics change, getting that uh, HBO Max play instead of theatrical play first, um, there's a lot of things, like you're saying, the financial implications, the theatrical implications, the, the um, even the marketing implications that just won't play out the way um, anybody needs to be successful. And I don't yeah. think Warner Brothers is sitting on a bunch of cash. They're not, 
Yeah. We're, uh, here's my prediction. We're going to look at an acquisition of Warner Brothers pretty soon. Someone else is going to. Ooh, that's a big one. Because, uh, I mean, Time Warner, obviously, they have the ability and, and um, to kind of keep things afloat for a while. But somebody's going to step in here and say, hey, I actually want a studio. And one of our OTT platforms, we'll call it, this is what we're going to call it, uh, Time Warner TikTok <laughs> um, studio pretty soon or something like that. <laughs> Facebook studio. <laughs> right? Because uh, Sony has the same issues. Warner Brothers has the same issues. Like, there, there isn't any reason why some of these studios wouldn't be acquired by a big tech company pretty soon that needs that that ability to... Well, to it's provide. always, always going to be an issue of, like, what what's providing the pipeline, the content pipeline for all these streamers. And, you know, Warner Media, at and in particular, they, they need Warner Brothers. They need the talent. They need that that sort of pipeline of films to keep, you know, they've, they've made it clear HBO Max is their future. That's where they're leaning. That's where it's going. Um, and at and took on a lot, has a lot of debt they got to get rid of. So it's entirely possible that that could be on the table. I mean, I'm not going to say anything is impossible in this day and age. Yeah. No. Um, but it's interesting because you think about like the theatrical experience and you counter what HBO Max and Warner Media are doing with someone like Universal, who has clearly, while playing in, you know, we, lest we forget, when this all started, when the pandemic hit, they were the first ones like, no, we're taking troll, Trolls World Tour, we're putting it on PVI. Boom, they made the decision. And it was earth shattering. AMC is like, we're never showing another Universal movie again. Like, yeah. but they've they've said no we are not giving and they've actually made moves to make you believe they still believe in the theatrical experience and according to one report they made over 500 million dollars last year just on sort of the piva because they've saved so much money in terms of marketing um and you know costs with regards to marketing and promotions and all that stuff so they've actually been able to turn a little bit of a profit on this um, and, you know, some of the bigger movies like Too Fast, Too Furious, they push towards when theaters will be back open. And they've struck deals with the exhibitors saying, if we don't hit this revenue mark or this box office mark within the first two weeks of release, then we have the option to take it on to our, to Peacock, which is their, obviously, NBC Universal Comcast platform. Yeah. But we'll give you, we'll give the exhibitors a, some, some uh, revenue compensation for that. So clearly Universal is like, we're not giving up on the theatrical experience, but we need to survive this period of unsettledly, uncertainty. Whereas it seems like HBO Max and Warner Media are like, we just need to, we just need to get our movies out. We just need to do it. Yeah, I, well, you know, I think about Comcast had the advantage though with, uh, well, Comcast Universal had the advantage of Comcast Cable. So yeah, they've actually been dealing with the online distribution for, you know, yes. from, their, from their genesis. And now they're basically playing out a different part. So it's interesting that their fight is with the theatrical group where Disney is actually adding to it, and Warner is just stuck in the middle. And again, I have Sony, what's Sony doing along the way here? Like, they're going to have to have a totally different play here, or just yeah. follow her along the way. Yeah, I mean, because they just pushed Mobius, I think, till 2022, which is one of their big temple so Marvel movies. I mean, at a certain point, they got to start making some money. Yeah, they, you have to cash flow a studio. That studio is yeah. not paying for itself. They're, they're making they're making rent down. Yeah, they're, uh, I mean, they oh, got they got some big salaries to pay there, and just laying people off ain't gonna keep the lights on. So, yeah. again, they're another another group. It's just so interesting how everyone has chosen to deal with it. I think Universal has been one of the smarter ones as far as this plays. I think Disney's leaning into where they're most successful right now. Like, obviously, Disney Plus is huge for them. Their parks are closed in California. That was a big revenue for them, their biggest, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to plug that hole. So they're leaning into where they can make money. And HBO Max is like, Bleh! you know, Warner Media just doesn't seem to know one way or another what they're doing. And it, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, that's for sure. And if I was a filmmaker, you know, it's just, again, it's a shame because Warner Media was, Warner Brothers in particular, the studio, was known as the place you went if you were talent and you wanted to be cared for. You want to go to a place where they believe in your movie, they will do what they need to do to open it. It was Warner Brothers. Yeah. They now flush that down the toilet. And now it's like, what are they doing? What, who are they? Who are they? What are they doing as a studio? What, you know, the negotiating in terms of where the movies are going to be, it's probably a mess. I mean, it's just, I think they just, again, I'll, I'll qualify all that by saying if this ends up working and Jason, Jason Kalar is going to look like a, a genius. But if this ends up continuing to be a bumpy road ahead, he, it's not going to be as great for him or his team. So yeah, and I and I have a feeling the push inside of Warner Brothers again is just for cash flow too. They have to get something out there to generate revenue in some way. They don't have any other candles that 
they're playing out, uh, at least for their theatrical side. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, back end with the mother companies that, that are kind of floating it. But cash flow is important at this time. And yeah. uh, any kind of boost that they could get would be great. So, well, I mean, it, it also helps. Like, if you look at what happened with Disney Plus in terms of, again, their parks are closed and still their stock is higher than it was at the start of the pandemic. Yeah, sure. It's insane. But it's because Disney Plus has been such a huge hit for them and they've made such really smart moves in terms of what content goes there. They've been obviously very clear with their talent of what, you know, how things are moving, what's happening. Um, their investor day was very clear. We're leaning into streaming. That is where we feel the consumers are going to be. That's where we're going to be. We're not giving up on theatrical. Um, I mean, that may have been a little bit more lip serve, but lip service, but at the same time, you can see that there definitely is a strategy there. Yeah, it's funny, 18 months ago, if we were talking about Disney Plus, I would have been dogging it about how slow the rollout is because I felt like it took them 20 years to get the thing started from the first acquisition of the tech to kind of like figure out the interface yeah. and what's going to be on there to finally making content for it. Um, but now you would say like, what it, you know, luck or genius, um, they, they had Disney Plus in the waiting so that the minute we needed something, we had our fix, we could turn on Disney I mean, Plus. Obviously, they're going to have their challenges. They, you know, they, they need more original content and they made some big promises during their investor day and we'll see if, if, if that upholds. The one, again, the positive to HBO Max is they're going to have new content for big, big name content throughout the year. So they're going to definitely have an opportunity to grow some subscriber base, but yeah. Disney Plus's challenge is also going to be how do we keep feeding the beast, if you will. Maybe they should hire Disney uh, theatrical marketing to roll out their HBO. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have, a new, right. they have a new marketing head over there, Josh Goldstein. So, um, and I know that he's been put in charge of handling a lot of the marketing for HBO Max films, for the films on HBO Max as well. So, and he's a theatrical marketing guy. So it'll be interesting to see how he adjusts to that, that shift. Um, and we'll see if it's similar to what Assad and his group did with Mandalorian and WandaVision. Yeah, so. I should hit up Josh and see what he's up to. I'm, uh, Josh, if you're listening, let's have coffee. I want to, I want to get in touch with <laughs> what you got going on over there. Well, I mean, I mean, he's probably not that busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to see him boost this thing. I want him to get the, all the credit for the good stuff that's going to come because there's obviously the challenges that he gets to kind of take over. Yeah, he, gets to, he gets to play. The, the, the ship has been broken, so now he gets to put it back together and see how yeah. it's uh, Get all the good credit. What a great timing. Um, we're rooting for you, Josh. Um, all right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, our half hour is wrapping up here. So thanks for uh, jumping on again, Keith, kind of giving us the download of your insider. Uh, I do want to announce next week, Robin's coming back. And uh, Robin's helping us kind of work behind the scenes, get some more um, uh, guests along alongside us here. Helps when you have two insiders working to, to <laughs> grab guests on the show. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get uh, more Robin's insight. I'd love to talk to her about some more of the talent-based stuff. I think the conversation we're having about Warner Brothers and uh, really what that's going to mean for the talent side and the creative side. It's going to be such an important play here. Um, for many of you, you are filmmakers and creative content makers, and you're probably wondering, like, you know, where's your opportunity and where's your angle? And I always think, you know, uh, if you hear the, the shakes up and changes, those are people who are willing to take the risk. Um, and those risk generated people, like we want to put ourselves forward there. That's the opportunities you're going to find. Uh, I, my belief is that people who are who kind of are making these decisions, make them for two reasons, preservation. So keep things going the way they are or promotion and promotion requires risk and change to do something new. So mm -hmm. um, Disney Max is definitely going to, should be kind of leading into that. Ooh, look what you did uh, there, Disney Max. I like that. <laughs> <I'm Disney> Max. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Hey, <laughs> Max. <laughs> All right. Hey, that was probably on the, the potential titles. I'm sure it was. Sure hey, it was. You, uh, Max was one of them. <laughs> you love, uh, if you love Keith and I messing up and you want to see more bloopers, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to release some for you so you can see some of the fun stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Um, and we have, we do have a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and others. If you're listening to us on podcasts, Make sure you give us that five-star rating so other people kind of learn about us. If you're going to give us a four-star rating or below, just don't give us a rating at all. Honestly, we don't need that. But, uh, <laughs> five-star ratings, and we'll even give you a Hollywood Breaks mug. We'll ship that right to you. Oh, all right. <laughs> I like it. Nice. Your family, so they can all drink out of the Hollywood Breaks. It's a cute mug because it just breaks. <laughs> <laughs> you put coffee in it, it just falls apart. Falls that apart. easy. That easy. All right, enough time.
Keith, thank you again. Uh, Lydia, behind the scenes, we appreciate you producing this show, keeping it going, and all the work you're doing on social media. Connor, thanks for your support, keeping our team going and helping us do these little clips. Um, until next week, we'll see you Hollywood Breaks. Robin, we're looking forward to having you next week. See you next week.